If you're taking AP US government, you're in the right place. I'm John from Marco Learning. I've got Tom Ritchie and George Washington crossing the Delaware here to help us out tonight. Tom, how are you doing? Oh, doing okay. And I think uh, I think uh, George Washington's on his way to uh, Marco Learning headquarters in New Jersey, right? That's probably right. In fact, I live about three minutes from Washington Crossing. I'll tell you, it's a very underwhelming part of the world. Um, but every year at Christmas, 8,000 people sit there um, in the morning dressed up like George Washington um, and all his minions on that boat going five feet across. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the government that comes after George Washington crosses the Washington, the Delaware River. And Tom, we, we're going to be giving tips to people who are taking the AP US government exam tomorrow. You were just live on your channel. You've got a playlist for AP US government. What are some of the big themes that you covered on your channel tonight? Uh, well, we looked at uh, some of the cases. You know, we started with the theories of democracy already. Um, we looked at a few cases. We looked at Citizens United. We looked at, uh, you know, Gideon. Um, and a few others, uh, you know, we didn't look at all of them. Okay, so excellent. Yeah, so I, you know, we see that uh, Elise, I think, came over from the other uh, from the other broadcast. So we've got a few people here. So yeah, y'all go ahead and get your questions in because definitely we didn't do Shaw, we didn't do Baker. Um, we're going to get that. Okay, so as far as that goes, uh, the dynamic duo. Thank you, Caleb, and also. For those of you who came from my channel, um, if you're not familiar with Marco Learning, this is John Muscatello, the CEO. And John, um, do you want to, you know, while they're getting their questions in, uh, we've got a question about Shaw and Baker, but while we're getting some other questions in, uh, can you tell them a little bit about what Marco Learning can offer them, not only for this exam, but for other exams they might be taking? Yeah, so at Marco Learning, we help AP students through the AP season and then afterwards with college admissions and all sorts of other things. I'm going to be posting in this chat where I want you guys, I am Marco Learning in this chat. Um, I'm posting a link to our study guides um, where we've got two study guide packs for you that are free for you to download. There's free practice tests on our website as well. And as Tom's saying, for especially for people taking digital exams, our student support courses, you can send in your free response essays and we'll grade them for you. So check that out. That does not apply for people taking Gov tomorrow morning, but if you're taking a subject uh, next week, if you're taking other subjects through the month, check that out. I'll be posting those links there. And I just wanna encourage all of you who are, um, who are joining, if you like this video, press that like button, subscribe to our channel and be in touch with us at Marco. We have tons of free resources and advice to help you out. So um, Tom, I'm gonna let you start addressing some of these questions. We're already seeing some great things. Thank you for joining us tonight and uh, let us know guys how we can help you out. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, now one thing I will say is that Anne, um, Citizens United, I did go over the Citizens United case on my channel already. So that's something I will direct you to the live thing that I did earlier. Um, but I did not already do Baker versus Carr and Shaw versus Reno. Okay, so let me go ahead and get into those because those are some important cases. Um, hopefully I don't put you to sleep though. I think I did all a lot of the more interesting and flashy cases earlier, right? Um, so as far as that goes, um, Baker and Shaw, are both cases that have to do with political questions. Now, one thing that we want to note is that Baker versus Carr is a landmark Supreme Court case because it is one of the first cases where the Supreme Court got involved in something that is a question of, you know, political, like, you know, redis redistricting and stuff like that. So with it, you know, we, we are supposed to, excuse me, just a second, let me take five seconds off to quit hip hiccuping. I think holding your breath for five seconds actually works, or at least it does for me. You know, I'm not going to stand on my head here. But as far as that goes, um, in Federalist 78, okay, so when we're thinking about the foundational documents, Alexander Hamilton writes, now remember, you can go to marcolearning.com and you've got a foundational document study pack um, that we've got uh, Federalist number 78. Oops, <laughs> all right, 1780, 1780. Oh my goodness. Okay, so I probably, 78 wasn't the best thing to look for, was it? It. Federalist 51. Okay, Federalist number 78. Okay, this is where Hamilton's addressing the judiciary. And Hamilton here in Federalist number 78, he writes that, uh, that basically we're going to have an independent judiciary. And so, you know, yes, our judges aren't elected. And of course, uh, the anti-Federalists, such as Brutus, criticize that practice. You know, the judges are not even elected. That's undemocratic. Well, Hamilton says, but they are 
they're independent. They're politically independent, you know, which of course, uh, you know, there are different thoughts on that as we go into things like judicial activism versus judicial restraint, you know, uh, you know, how much, how independent is a judge really? Uh, you know, judicial activism is more on where a judge will put in their, uh, they'll give their two cents, you know, they'll think about, well, this is what I think about this. Whereas judicial restraint is an effort to say, I want to try to take my opinion out of this and go based on what the law says, okay? So in Federalist 78, Hamilton writes, not only will the judiciary be the least dangerous branch, you're not even going to feel a thing, right? Um, that it is going to, uh, you know, as far as that goes, um, that the, you know, when, when we see that, that it's the least dangerous, but it's also independent. And one of the things about Baker is the Supreme Court's going into some territory where it really hasn't been before. And there were a few like uh, kind of hardy dissents um, in this one, because what's happening here is essentially Tennessee. They're getting sued because they have not uh, redrawn their districts according to population. And so what's happening here, since they hadn't redrawn their districts, that some of their districts had more people than others. Now, when I think about Baker, Baker sets up the principle of one person, one vote, um, basically saying that, uh, you know, now remember the facts of the case, that is the Tennessee state uh, legislature had not redistricted. And then we see that uh, the decision, a six to two decision, um, the court said that, and remember, the decision is what the court decides. The facts is what are in the background leading to it. And so the court decides that states have to redistrict. OK, so when it comes uh, when it comes to this, um, you know, there was a disagreement whether this was a political question. But the majority here uh, now to the two in the minority said this is a political question. The court should stay out of this. But the you know, the six uh, the six vote majority said this is not a political question. This is a question of justice because it's the principle of one person, one vote. Now, when I think Baker versus Carr, when I'm trying to distinguish this between Shaw versus Reno, because they're similar cases, I think that if a baker is baking cookies, the cookie should be the same size, okay? So if the baker is baking cookies, the cookie should be the same size. That's what I'm thinking about baker versus Carr, okay? And so with that, um, you know, that's what I, you know, that's kind of how I remember this. But basically, electoral districts have to be the same size and the Supreme Court is getting into a political question. OK, now also now Shaw versus Reno. This is a 1993 case and basically um, redistricting. Now, North Carolina, um, under the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which the Supreme Court has since kind of made defunct, uh, at least until there are some revisions. But at the time, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, um, what it did is it said that if states covered by this act, okay, so 1965 Voting Rights Act, um, it said that states that in the 60s had a history of discrimination, for example, if the state had a history of discrimination, um, then um, the federal government would have to approve any changes in election law, any changes in redistricting or anything like that. Now I'm looking for the map. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. So basically North Carolina is partially covered under or was partially covered under the Voting Rights Act. So North Carolina, when they redrew their congressional districts, it had to go before the federal government. And so the Justice Department, uh, you know, Janet Reno was Bill Clinton's, uh, you know, Bill Clinton's secretary um, of, uh, or not secretary, but attorney general, which, uh, of course, Janet Reno was played, used to be played by Will Ferrell on Saturday Night Live, you know, where they do like Janet Reno's dance party or whatever. Um, so, uh, so Janet Reno was the defendant here, okay? So they are suing Janet Reno there. And essentially is that the court said that North Carolina had to make a second majority minority district, okay? And so what North Carolina did is they created this pink one here. Now we're familiar with gerrymandering, right? Gerrymandering is when you are manipulating um, in order for things to go with the um, with the majority party in the state. Okay, so gerrymandering, yeah. So gerrymandering, you know, we're looking at gerrymandering. Um, this is something that uh, you know unequal representation of constituencies. Now, what we would note here is, for example, you know. 
2020 uh, presidential election in South Carolina, for example. Okay, so 2020 presidential election in South Carolina. You can see here where in this election, Donald Trump got 55% and Joe Biden got uh, 43%. Okay, so 55 to 43. Um, that's not exactly razor thin, but that means that, you know, over, you know, over 40%, you know, of South Carolinians support the Democratic Party. Now, if we look at South Carolina, congressional districts, okay? And, and every state does this, okay? Now, some states have independent commissions that district, but when you look at South Carolina, like some of the districts are very clean, okay? Like I live in the third district, okay? That's a very clean, cleanly drawn district, fourth, fifth, the seventh, uh, but then you start to see the first, the second, and the sixth district, okay? So when we're looking at this, you notice how, you know, the say it, it kind of looks like somebody's arm, like they're putting their arm, like they're like, I'm going to show you my muscles. It's like the second district is like showing its muscles, and it's like, why is this, okay? What is the meaning of this part here, and why does the first district just kind of reach over here, okay? And the reason for for that is the sixth district is designed to be a majority minority district. Okay, so the sixth district is here in the I-95 corridor, and this is where you have, uh, you know, a high population of Black Americans. And so the sixth district is intended to be a majority minority district, but it's also drawn in a way in which this district will produce very high Democratic majorities um, in return for the other districts tending to be safe Republican districts. And so with that, if you've never played the redistricting game, tonight may not be the best time to be up all night playing that. But, you know, as far as that goes, remember that 44% of South Carolinians voted for um, Joe Biden, voted for, for President Biden in the election. But notice here, one, two, three, four, five, six Republicans, okay? So Jim Clyburn represents uh, the sixth district. So what we see here is if we're gonna calculate this, I'm not, uh, you know, John's done a lot of, uh, you know, test prep SAT math, but I'm gonna go ahead and divide, you know, six by seven, and that's 86%. So basically 44% of South Carolinians uh, voted Democratic in the 2020 presidential election, but, 86% of our congressional delegation is Republican. And part of that is because of the, you know, so when we're looking at, uh, you know, Jim Clyburn's electoral history, okay? So when we look here, um, let's see, political positions, electoral, where is, uh, let's see. Okay, so, you know, as far as elections, Okay, so when we're looking at uh, 2010, 2008, um, so let's, yeah, let's just look at maybe 2010, okay? So we can see here, he got 62% of the vote, okay? And this was actually in like a Republican wave year. 2010 was a Republican wave year. And even in that Republican wave year, he's getting 62% of the vote. And so with that, this is something that it's got, you know, that district has such a large uh, Democratic population that it is making all the other districts more Republican. Now, with that, let's go back to Shaw versus Reno, okay? So what we see here is when you look at Shaw versus Reno, it's like, whoa, this, this pink district here is just like, I mean, it's like literally the size of like one road. And it's just like, what is this? Now, of course, I could also ask, what is this, okay? Or what is this? I mean, this is so bizarre. Uh, you know, when you look, it looks like somebody spilled something. Like basically they got like, uh, you know, one of those modern artists or something like that to like, hey, why don't you uh, make the districts? And it's like, okay, well, I'm gonna spill something here. And look, I made an art or something like that, except it's a congressional district map. And so with that, you know, it's the Supreme Court is having to consider, is it, is it okay for a state to do something like this? 
And what the court decides is that there is nothing wrong. Now, this is 5-4, okay? Um, but what the court decides is that there is nothing, um, you know, nothing unconstitutional or ir illegal about having majority minority districts, okay? So that's something that the court says majority minority districts, that's okay, as long as it is not obvious that it is the only thing being considered, okay? So in the case of this, the Supreme Court says, you know what, this is a political question, that's up to the state, uh, whether that makes sense or not, okay? The Supreme Court, remember, an independent judiciary, it's like, you know what, whatever. But then they said this, that is a problem, okay? That is a problem because it's so obvious that the only reason that district was drawn is in regard to race. And so that's what you see from that decision that basically now, of course, there are some minority opinions. I mean, not um, these are dissenting opinions. I'm sorry. Um, so dissenting opinions um, that say that, you know, states should be able to draw districts that give minorities more representation because this did, this is another thing here that, you know, the result of this decision is that there was less minority representation in the North Carolina congressional delegation than there would have been here. But understand that principle, because if we're comparing this to other cases, the Supreme Court says it's OK to consider race as a factor when you're districting, but it cannot be so obvious that it's the only factor. Now, when we're comparing, when you think about Supreme Court comparison cases, um, that uh, Bakke versus California, for example, this is not um, this is not one of your 15, but this is a case where there was a guy in 1978, you know, Baki was applying for the University of California Davis School of Medicine. And so basically it was decided by UC Davis that 16 out of 100 seats would be set aside for minority students. So basically we will not have more than 84 white students in our uh, incoming class. And so Baki, you know, did not get in, but he was, uh, you know, he was basically, he didn't get in because of the quota system. So there were some people that got in that were substantially less qualified than he was. So what the Supreme Court ruled in Baki versus California, um, and we see here that this was, uh, you know, you can see a lot of different things here, okay? So uh, we see here one, two, three, four, five, okay? And then we have a plurality there and all that kind of stuff. So what the Supreme Court said was that colleges and universities, they can consider racial diversity as one of many factors, okay? So if we were comparing something like this to Shaw versus Reno, they can consider it as one of many factors, but they cannot have a hard quota system, okay? So this is where when you're thinking about affirmative action, the Supreme Court has not struck down the idea of affirmative action, you know, that governments, uh, you know, and other uh, institutions related to government should be able to, according to the doctrine of affirmative action, uh, you know, should be able to take some measures in order to compensate compensate for institutional racism and some of the inequalities um, that, uh, that minority applicants might face. But again, just like in Baker versus, uh, I mean, not Baker, but Shaw versus Reno, just like in Shaw versus Reno, in Regents versus Bakke, they said that you cannot have, you know, it cannot be the only thing that's being considered. So that's something to keep in mind when you do things like a Supreme Court comparison. It's going to be about how is this decision like similar or different? They take a similar case with a similar or different result and go from there. So as far as that goes, okay, now one thing I'm going to note here, Ruth's question versus uh, Thanasis' question. Now, when I hear like, can you go over the rest of the Supreme Court cases? I'm sorry, y'all, but at 1030, I'm out of here, if not a few minutes earlier, okay? I've been broadcasting and tutoring about all day. And so with that, uh, you know, I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to go over Schenck versus the United States, okay? So that's something when we're thinking about Schenck versus the U.S., you know, y'all are asking about that. Yes, I would be glad to go over a specific case, okay? So as far as that, uh, as that goes, Schenck versus the United States, all right? So we've got... 
Think for, and, and again, these guides, these beautiful guides are available at marcolearning.com, okay? So Schenck versus the United States. Now, the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or the preventing the free exercise thereof or abridging freedom of speech. Now, the thing is, the First Amendment is very close to being absolute, but it's not completely absolute. So for example, you know, you can't like, you know, go and do something to incite panic, you know, running into a crowded uh, theater and, yep, you know, which are there crowded theaters anymore? Remember back when that was a thing, uh, you know, so running into a crowd and yelling fire, fire, there's a fire. You know, that is something that you are inciting panic and disturbing the peace. That is a crime. OK. And so with that, uh, you know, you also cannot, uh, you know, if you say or write something false. OK. And that falsehood ends up being something that, uh, you know, that somebody ends up losing their job or losing money or something like that. That is something that could be a very, uh, you know, a very bad thing uh, for you because that person can sue you. OK, if you say something false about someone and it leads to that person, um, you know, being, uh, you know, being damaged financially or like substantial harm for their reputation um, that makes it harder for them to get a job or something like that. Um, you know, you can you can be sued. So, you know, watch which make sure that what you're saying is truthful. And also the next thing here is does your freedom of speech allow you to openly advocate that people violate the law? And then let's take that a step further. Can, does the First Amendment allow you to advocate that people openly flaunt the law? in wartime, okay? And so with this, Schenck versus the United States, basically Schenck and uh, you, a few people, they were part of the Socialist Party of Philadelphia. And so they are, uh, you know, they're basically, you know, passing out these pamphlets and they're saying that they're basically putting out, uh, you know, their opinion, but in the government's view, this is like misinformation. They're, they're claiming that the draft is, a violation of the 13th Amendment, um, that the draft is involuntary servitude, and therefore the draft is illegal, and that Americans should dodge the draft, like they should basically openly resist the draft. And so they're going and they're passing these things out. And so they're arrested under the Espionage and Sedition Acts. And so they're arrested, and they are saying, look, this is my First Amendment right. And so what happens here is the decision it was unanimous, the Supreme Court, they issue what's called the clear and present danger test, okay? So the clear and present danger test is something that is established um, by Schenck, okay? And so that's something that is, uh, you know, the clear and present danger test is established by Schenck. And that is something that, um, you know, this clear and present danger test says, that if the speech pre presents a clear and present danger, then it's something that can be, uh, you know, it's something that can be um, outlawed, okay? Like the government can say, like, this is a clear and present danger. Now, one thing to note is there is a, you know, there is a case um, where, you know, there's been a subsequent case that says like Brandenburg, Brandenburg versus Ohio, um, that what we see here is they say, is the speech going to cause imminent lawless action? Okay, so one thing that we want to note is that Schenck um, has been in some terms, you know, it's been basically, I don't know if I'd say, go so far as say like it's been overturned, but it's been updated, okay? So the reason why Shink's here and the reason why Shink is still relevant um, is that, you know, it established this principle that, you know, there are limits to protected speech, you know, when somebody, when speech is creating a danger, you know, so in now one thing to note, most of my friends who are legal experts, uh, they have told me that today's Supreme Court would have not uh, upheld the, convic the conviction of Schenck and his friends. Like basically the Supreme Court has gotten a lot more lenient when it comes to speech. And that's why where we see Brandenburg versus Ohio in 1969, the Supreme Court says it's not enough to say, oh, well that speech is a clear and present danger. 
that's not enough. It needs and now the standard is when government prohibitions of speech are placed under strict scrutiny, it has to be imminent lawless action. Is this going to result in imminent lawless action? So keep that in mind. But then again, why is this here? Because it's here to note that there can be, you know, even though those limits are few and far between, there can be limits. Now then tinker, okay, tinker versus Des Moines, that is another one that we want to note here. Now, this is the companion for Schenck, okay? It's always nice to bundle these together. Um, Tinker v. Des Moines is kind of a companion case for Schenck. And so with that, Tinker is the one that reminds us that we have our rights. Now, I'm going to step away real quick. I just need to turn my AC down a little bit because it's getting a little bit hot in here. And uh, I think, uh, you know, reviewing can be intense. All right, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, um, that Tinker versus Des Moines. Now, this is one of those things that, uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, those of you who've been going to school in person, okay, there is, uh, you know, for example, like, you know, schools that have been doing in-person schools typically require like students to wear, uh, you know, to wear a mask. And so, you know, one of the things that you inevitably had was like, you know, what are students allowed to have on their masks? You know, are they allowed to have like political messages? Uh, you know, there was actually, you know, I've seen, you know, students, um, you know, sometimes use their mask in order to state their opinion about having to wear a mask. You know, how, you know, how much can a student use this to, uh, you know, I mean, there, there are sometimes administrators be like, oh, you're not allowed to, uh, you're not allowed to have that on your mask, or you're not allowed to have like a political advertisement or something like that. Well, the thing is, Tinker is the case where, uh, you know, somebody would, uh, you know, where you would have that, okay? Like there was one time, like I heard, like I actually heard a student, uh, you know, being told that they couldn't have something on their mask. And I was just like, hey, you know, I mean, when I saw the student, I just kind of casually said, you know, hey, when I've taught AP government in the past, like there's this, uh, there's this case that we have to learn called Tinker versus Des Moines. You might want to look it up. You know, I mean, it's one of those things like, you know, I just, I, I'm just, I'm just educating. That's what I do. Right. Uh, you know, but I was just like, you might want to look that up, uh, you know, just kind of casually. I mean, just like you might want to look that up because um, the tinkers, you know, they wore, you know, armbands. Okay. They wore armbands to school, like black armbands in order to protest the Vietnam war. And so with that, they were told by their administrators, you can't do that, okay, because you're at school and school needs to be orderly. The school is not a place to exercise your constitutional rights. Well, the thing is that they decide, like the tinkers, they end up bringing this to the Supreme Court, okay? And so as far as that, the Supreme Court takes their case. And the thing is that it's not, uh, you know, they weren't doing anything. They were just wearing armbands. And so in a seven to two decision, the Supreme Court said the armbands did not cause a disruption in the school environment, okay, and therefore present, represented an appropriate and constitutionally protected expression of symbolic speech, okay, and so as far as that goes, that basically you don't lose your rights uh, when you go to school. Now, here's the thing, though, you can't, uh, you know, so when we say, you know, I was talking about earlier, you know, the messages you can have on your mask, uh, you know, it can't be something obscene or it can't be something, you know, in, you know, there are things that like the schools do have a way that they can, you know, first, you know, just like Bethel School District versus Frazier. Um, this was a case in 1986 where basically, um, you know, a student, a student, uh, you know, a, like basically gave a campaign speech for a student government campaign where, uh, you know, it had a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of innuendo, a lot of double entendres and, double, you know, it's like things that could be taken both ways. You kind of know what he's getting at. But, you know, he had all of these things that he was saying and they didn't cross the line into obscenity. But one thing to note here is that uh, in 1986, the Supreme Court said, you know, this is something administrators have a right to punish a student 
for, uh, you know, for basically something that is vulgar, okay? So for using like vulgar language or something like that. So this has been like reined in a little bit. You don't have the right to be vulgar, um, but you have a right to, re you know, basically to, uh, you know, to express your, uh, your opinions, you know, especially your political opinions. Like when it comes down to it, um, the school does not have a right to tell you that you can't engage in, uh, you know, in political speech is what we see there. Now, if the political speech is disruptive, okay, so for example, if you were like, you know, I'm going to, you know, just stand up in class and I'm going to, you know, start talking or something like that, that we're all going to stand up in class and we're going to talk over our teachers at whatever time because we want to protest something's going on here, you can get in trouble for that. But if it's something that's quiet and not just disruptive, then you are free to use your First Amendment rights. Um, so with that, that's just an interesting kind of, uh, you know, kind of thing there in terms of that, you know, you do have rights um, when you are a, uh, you know, when you are a student. OK, so as far as that now, we did we did iron triangles already on my channel, um, but we do see that there are a lot of people here that were saying that. OK, and I think that's being exchanged in the chat that basically iron triangles, the interest group helps a person get elect, get elected to Congress. That person gets elected to Congress. They favor things that are friendly toward that interest group. They don't. Uh, they don't launch investigations into that interest group. And then, when it comes time to appoint people to the bureaucracy, people from that interest group end up getting into that bureaucracy. So, for example, one example of iron triangles would be like a lot of times people on the FCC, for example, the independent agency that the Federal Communications Commission that regulates communications, uh, mass communications. And so with that, when we're thinking about, uh, you know, mass communications, um, what we're thinking, like there are people who are actually from the communications industry. All right. And Wade has given uh, fives to everyone. OK, now due process that has to do with that's one of your civil liberties. So uh, Bandita, I've actually got a video on my channel. If you type civil rights versus civil liberties, um, civil liberties, that's my right to due process, um, my right to uh, free speech, my right to bear arms, my protection against unreasonable searches and seizures. Um, these are civil liberties, okay? And then part of my due process in particular is that I, if I'm arrested, before I'm asked any questions, I have to be Mirandized, right? I have to have my Miranda rights read to me that says that I don't have to talk. I don't have to say anything in response to anything. Now, equal protection, the equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment, that is where we are um, dealing with uh, your civil rights, that you have a right to be treated equally. Now, Brown versus the Board of Education is an equal protection case, okay? So the equal protection case, and that is Brown v. Board. So with that, let's see, uh, let's see what we've, uh, what we've got here. And yes, those, okay, so yeah, we will be back doing doing um, digital, you know, like the night before the digital exams, uh, you know, I believe we're planning on doing some night before broadcast as well. Okay, linkage institutions. Now, I, yeah, my brain isn't working right now. I can definitely hear you, Clay. Um, been tutoring and broadcasting all day and all weekend. Um, somebody asked him, like, oh, well, at least it's not the work week. And I'm like, I, I thought every day was a work day now. But as far as that goes, Clay, I'm going to let you know that I also have a video on linkage institutions. Linkage institutions are the institutions that they link voters with the government. OK, so understand what we've uh, you know, what we've got here uh, is that linkage institutions link the, the people to the government. Like right now, I don't have any way to influence the government. So our linkage institutions are the media, political parties, interest groups, and then, of course, elections. OK, now elections just happen once in a while. But basically, if I want to know what's going on in the government, I'm either going to turn on the TV, I'll pick up a newspaper or a magazine, um, or I will get on the internet and go to my favorite news website or something like that. So the media is a linkage institution in the sense because media means in the middle. So the media is a linkage institution that lets me know what's going on. 
Now, then, you know, the political parties are linkage institutions as well because the political party is a way that I can organize. So it's like, you know, I can go to a local party meeting and I can, uh, you know, and also I can see, you know, when somebody gets uh, the nomination of a party, then that person has been vetted to a certain extent. You know, most Americans don't vote in primary elections, but they tend to support one party or the other. Now I've got a video on party identification um, party identification means like what party do you tend to support? Now, identifying as a Democrat or Republican is not just registering. Um, identifying as a member of a party, you can register. You can say that you're part of that party. You can tend to vote for that party's candidates. OK, like if you've got a tendency to vote for that party's candidates or to vote in that party's primary, then that is an example of party identification. So most people, like very few people, are truly not tied to a party. Most people like either lean one way or they lean another. They have a tendency to support one party's candidates. And so for most Americans, like very few Americans are what you would call activists. Like most Americans are not really all that into politics, okay? They're, they may support a party, they may go vote in the general election, but that's about all they do. So parties are very useful for that because for a lot of Americans, they're like, you know what, I tend to support this party. Now, interest groups, okay, so if I care about an issue, um, then I'm going, you know, whether that is, uh, you know, abortion, guns, immigration, uh, you know, a whole host of other issues, uh, that these are issues where you really as a single American, your efficacy is, you know, how much are you going to do on your own? But you can find an interest group and say, you know what, I'm a busy, I'm a busy person and I'm going to give $30 to this interest group. And so what happens is all of these other people are giving $30 or $50 or $100 to the same interest group. And this interest group is linking you with the government, okay? So this is giving you a way to influence government by giving to this uh, to this interest group. And this interest group is lobbying the government on your behalf. And of course, remember that the Citizens United case, which we covered in the previous, uh, you know, the previous thing on, on my channel, that has to do with interest groups. Now, remember that interest groups are also, uh, you know, are also something that, uh, they are in the, um, what do you call it, uh, interest groups. I don't even know where I was going. Okay, with that. Oh, they're in Citizens United. Okay, so Citizens United and also Federalist 10. Okay, when we think of pluralist theories of democracy, that basically there are all of these factions. Okay, interest groups are political factions. You know, we tend to think about ourselves as part of a political faction. And so with that, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and uh, let's see here. Okay, got the uh, got the chat opened up here, and let's see what other uh, what other things we got here. Now, a legal brief, um, Ash, is called an amicus brief, amicus curiae. Okay, amicus, um, you know, an, an now actually, let's see, amicus. This actually never appears in the course and exam description. Um, let's see. Um, so let's see. Yeah, actually, an amicus. Yeah, amicus curiae is actually not in the course and exam description. That is very, very, um, you know, surprising. But you could use in your free response. You could say something about interest groups. Use amicus briefs, which amicus curiae means friend of the court. Okay, friend of the court. Now, a writ of certiorari, or I was like, writ of certiorari, you know, but writ of certiorari is when the Supreme Court says that we are going to take a case. Now, Federalist Papers, okay? Federalist 10, Federalist 51, 70, and 78. So 10 and 51, Madison. Now, remember, marcolearning.com, you've got guides for all of these, okay? So Federalist 10, basically Madison's making a, a single point here that's in two parts. First of all, Large republics are superior to small republics. And that is because a, in a large republic, a single faction cannot take over. Okay, so this is part of the pluralist theory of democracy. Then in a small republic like a state, a, sing a single faction can take over. Um, we, we noticed, I looked up in the last session on my channel, that 
38 states have what are called trifectas, okay, where one party has control of the governor's office, the Senate, and the House of the state. 38 states have that. Now, our federal government right now, technically, Democratic president, Democratic House, and Democratic Senate. But this Democratic House and Democratic Senate, the Democrats control both of these by the slimmest of margins, okay? And so as far as that goes, that control of these things always shifts in the federal government, whereas in a state, a single party can control a state for a long time. So yeah, Federalist 10, excellent, Caitlin. Large republics are superior because they, they keep a single faction from taking over. They keep factions in check. Federalist 51, anything to do with checks and balances, okay? So Madison is going into the way the legislative, executive, judicial can check each other. Also, a little note, most people don't read deep enough in the, Feder deep enough in the Federalist 51. Federalist 51 also goes into how the states check the central government as well. So basically, you've got the horizontal checks and balances, uh, you know, where you've got legislative, executive, judicial, and then you've also got the states, you know, what we might call vertical checks and balances, that the states can also check the federal government. The reason for Federalist 51 is that the Constitution is giving the, go the federal government powers that it did not have under the Articles of Confederation, okay, powers that it did not have under the Articles. Um, but... Um, you know, what we're seeing here is powers that it didn't have, but Madison's saying it's okay that this government has more powers because what the articles didn't have is checks and balances. And so since there are checks and balances, then it's okay that this government has more power because it's set up to where one, we go back to Federalist 10, you know, a single group of people can't wield it because you've got all of the separation of powers and checks and balances. So with that, um, then we go to Federalist 70. Okay. Yeah. Federalist 70 is 70 and 78 are Hamilton. So 70 is Hamilton talking about the executive branch. Um, and then 78 is Hamilton talking about the judiciary. Now, 70 is Hamilton being Hamilton, okay? Hamilton is like, he says, look, the executive branch needs energy. Now, that is where, remember, that Alexander Hamilton is a fan of a strong central government. Um, at the Constitutional Convention, which was kept secret at the time, Hamilton said, why don't we just get rid of the states, okay? Like, why don't we just turn the states into administrative districts? And that's, uh, you know, and that's it. Um, get rid of their independent powers. Hamilton wasn't a fan of federalism. But Federalist 70, you know, he's defending what's called a unitary executive. So a unitary executive, you know, why do we have an independent executive branch that is led by just one person? And Hamilton is answering that. Hamilton says that the executive branch needs energy, okay? The executive branch runs on energy, and there shouldn't be internal checks and balances. Now, the legislative branch, you know, which Madison talked about in Federalist 51, the Senate and the House can check each other. But Hamilton says the executive branch acts, it needs energy. And therefore, you need to have one person that is in charge of the entire operation of the government. OK, so that is, uh, you know, that's something that is important. Yeah, these uh, these mugs are actually available as merch. You should be able to go to Teespring, Marco. This is a Marco learning mug. Um, you know, you can get that. It's I love AP. It doesn't say I love the college board. So it's not. I mean, but yeah, if y'all like the mugs, there you go. Now. So Hamilton says the executive branch needs energy. That's why we need a unitary executive, one person in charge of everything. OK, now, 78. This is where he has to answer Brutus. Brutus number one. Now, Brutus number one to me is the foundational document that probably talks the most sense, okay? Because Brutus says, you know, we, I mean, all of these Federalist papers are kind of like they, they're responding in some way to Brutus. Because Brutus says that when, when Hamilton in 78 says the judiciary it's good that we have an independent judiciary that's not elected because it'll stay out of politics, right? The judiciary, they'll just stay out of politics. And also, Hamilton promises in Federalist 78 that the judiciary will be the least dangerous branch. 
And what he's doing is he's responding to Brutus. Brutus says this federal judiciary is going to basically, you know, it is going to make the states obsolete pretty much. OK. And so when we look at that, that, you know, that Hamilton, that basically, you know, Hamilton responding to Brutus, when we look at what happened to the federal judiciary, Brutus was much more on the mark. OK, that, the, that Brutus said this federal judiciary is going to be very powerful and it's going to be outside of the immediate control of the people. And it really kind of is. Whereas Hamilton said, ah, oh, least dangerous branch Marbury versus what? You know, that kind of thing. OK, so that's where I mean, Hamilton is more of a salesman, whereas Madison, I find that Madison is more explaining what's in the Constitution. Hamilton in 70 and 78 is trying to sell it. Now, as far as that, you know, necessary and proper clause is important, my peeps. All right, the Commerce Clause, Vandita, the Commerce Clause is a clause of the Constitution that basically it gives um, the central, uh, you know, it gives the central government, uh, you know, like basically the federal government control over interstate commerce. That means foreign commerce and commerce between states. OK, so that is interstate commerce. But states retain control of intrastate commerce, commerce that happens within states. And so with that, the commerce clause is very important. Now, um, a commerce clause case, when we're looking at our um, Supreme Court cases, remember, you can go to marcolearning.com free, you know, and then free stuff and free study guides. And you can find um, the study guide here for, um, you know, Lopez. OK, so United States versus Lopez. Now, the thing is that uh, let's see. Oh, that's foundational documents. That's why that's not there. Um, the United States versus Lopez. This is a 1995 Rehnquist court case. Um, and so this is basically, you know, the Congress. Now, McCulloch versus Maryland. OK, let's back up. OK, so McCulloch versus Maryland is a supremacy clause case where the state of Maryland tried to tax the Bank of the United States. OK, state of Maryland tried to tax the Bank of the United States. And uh, this is where I mean, the Bank of the United States is not among the enumerated powers um, that, you know, it never says in the Constitution that, you know, the government has the right to charter a bank. But then we see here in the facts of the case, you know, it's like, OK, the government did charter a bank. And so the state of Maryland tried to put a tax on it. Well, John Marshall says, you know what? Uh, Second Bank of the United States, it is constitutionally legitimate. And therefore, it is, uh, you know, it is protected by the supremacy clause. Now, the supremacy clause of the Constitution, uh, you know, is something here that is often misunderstood, okay? Because the supremacy clause, um, what it says is that this Constitution, and the laws of the United States, that which shall be made in pursuance thereof, yada, yada, shall be the supreme law of the land. Now, if we were going over, uh, you know, John's an expert in the AP English, okay, but this constitution shall be the supreme law of the land. That is the core of this sentence, okay? This constitution shall be the supreme law of the land. Now, note here in fancy language, and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof. Now, note here, it doesn't say, and the laws of the United States, which shall be made, but the laws have to be in pursuance thereof. Now, in McCulloch versus Maryland, uh, John Marshall said, well, you know what? Uh, John Marshall says that, you know, this is that the, cent that the Bank of the United States is in pursuance thereof and therefore it's protected by the supremacy clause. But we need to understand that the supremacy clause does not mean that Congress can make any law at once, that the Supreme Court is gonna have to conclude that Congress has a right uh, to make this law, that basically this has to tie back and link somehow to a power that Congress has. So when we look at United States versus Lopez, okay, what happens here is that Congress in 1990, they said they passed the Gun-Free School Zones Act. And they said that, OK, so we're going to uh, pass this act and it's a federal crime for anyone to knowingly possess a firearm in a school zone. And so what happens is Lopez, he's got an unloaded revolver and then he is charged as a federal criminal. Now, I either said in this uh, broadcast or the previous one that 
most of the time, if you're, you know, if, I mean, hopefully you never find yourself in a criminal court, but especially hopefully you never find yourself in a federal criminal court, because that probably means you're like mafia, kidnapping, serial killer, uh, you know, that kind of, you know, drug trafficking, that sort of thing. So, you know, stay away from that. Okay. But you, you know, this high school kid, you know, it's like he had an unloaded revolver and all of a sudden he's in federal court. Now, the thing is that Congress used the Commerce Clause. They said, you know what? Guns are manufactured in one state and then they're brought to other states. So therefore, we can make rules about where you can have a gun because guns are part of interstate commerce. And the Supreme Court is like, okay, come on now. All right, let's let's uh, let's reason together for a little bit, okay? And so, yeah, you see, I mean, you know, Rehnquist, it looks like Rehnquist's like a meme waiting to happen. I mean, I really think here, you know, that's how Rehnquist is looking at this application of the Commerce Clause. And so what happens here in the decision, so the facts of the case, you know, Lopez is arrested for violating the Federal Gun-Free Schools Act. But the thing is that the Supreme Court says, now this is five to four, but the Supreme Court says, look, that is too generous of an application of the Commerce Clause because there's nothing in the Constitution that gives the federal government that kind of power to say what can and can't be brought to school. Now, Lopez, you know, he was somebody that he broke a state law for sure, you know, that it's not like schools, even in Texas, uh, don't tell you like, hey, why don't you bring a gun here? Uh, you know, that's, uh, but as far as that goes, that the Rehnquist court, now it was 5-4, uh, you know, with a more conservative majority saying like, look, this is, this was too much, uh, you know, the, the Commerce Clause does not give the federal government control over everything, that basically this law was not in pursuance thereof. So basically with Lopez, um, it's a Commerce Clause case, but I always like to highlight how this is an example of how the Supremacy Clause, um, you know, is, you know, that it does not give the federal government, Congress, you know, the right to pass any law that it wants, okay? And so as far as that uh, as that goes, gosh, we still got, uh, oh, this this audience is like growing, uh, you know, rather than shrinking, okay? So uh, some of y'all, is this a more, is this an AM or a PM exam? Uh, I think this is a morning exam. Some of y'all probably need to go to bed pretty soon. Um, but with that, uh, you know, we're seeing here that, oh gosh, what a, I mean, I almost feel like I can go to sleep and just let the chat keep going. Um, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, and John brought attention to the playlist that might, yeah, so I think that that's a great idea. I think John has actually come in and rescued me um, because I am, uh, I've been doing this for a, uh, for a long time here. So let me just go ahead and show off this playlist uh, because, you know, we've got a, got a good many videos. And so with this, if you go to the Marco Learning AP Gov playlist, um, there is the Federalist Papers Explained, and then we see the Declaration of Independence, Federalist 7. Um, then we've got several Supreme Court cases here, okay? So several Supreme Court cases. Um, and so then some last minute review, uh, that's actually what we're looking at right now, right? Um, that's going on right now. So McDonald versus Chicago. So I've got several of these, uh, several of these here. Um, that we've got uh, that we've got there. So with that, you've got a few Supreme Court cases. You've got a few, uh, you know, foundational documents. So we've got um, some good things there that'll keep you busy. But also, I think that it's very important that at some point y'all actually, uh, you know, y'all actually go to bed. Um, that would be a great, uh, you know, a great thing there. There will be, bre or wait, let's see. So when is this exam? Um, this exam, is oh, Marco is on screen. Okay, so Marco. yeah, it's an AM exam. Uh, okay. I'll have breakfast with Euro, but not with Gov. But yeah, so this is John and, and the real like CEO, uh, you know, we've got Marco. Hey, Marco. Marco says you all need to go to bed. It's past your bedtime. I might be going live, everyone. By the way, I'm John from... Marco learning that Marco. That's Marco from Marco learning. Oh, Tom, he gets heavier every time. I swear it's like 153 pounds of AP books um, and fluff. But listen, everyone, I'm going to be going live on Instagram with Marco real quick just to send everyone off to bed. Definitely check out the links in the description. Give this man, Tom Ritchie, a round of applause in the chat. I want emojis, sunglasses. We'll press the like button. Um, and definitely follow us on Instagram. We're going to be um, posting some new lives and information there. 
So Tom, let's wrap it up here. Wish everyone luck. And thank you all for coming to tonight. Yes, session. best of luck to everyone. Y'all have a uh, y'all have a wonderful night. Yeah, it's ten thirty on the uh, on the East Coast. For those of you in California, yeah, y'all have a great time. And like you know, like John was saying, at Marco Learning on Instagram, and uh, there will be a little after party over there.